Feels okay. Okay. So I'll do three, two, one. Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm Jamie Ward, the president of the British Association for Cognitive Neuroscience. And one of the perks of my job is that I get to invite my heroes of cognitive neuroscience to give a talk. Uh, so today I'm really pleased to invite Alfonso Karamatsa, who's a professor at Harvard University and also CIMEC in uh, Trento University. And he's going to be telling us uh, what is cognitive neuropsychology good for? So Alfonso kind of paved the way in terms of laying out some of the methodological or conceptual foundations of neuropsychology. Uh, but he's also done fantastic research um, looking at uh, aphasia, semantic memory, and also pulling down some of these trendy ideas such as embodied cognition, taking us uh, a critical look at these particular ideas. So Alfonso, if you want to uh, have a go at sharing your ski, uh, screen, and then I will leave you to it. That's that? <clears throat> That's perfect. Okay, look forward to your talk. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Jamie, for organizing uh, this event. I'm uh, uh, both uh, honored and uh, bit apprehensive about some of the things I'm going to be saying. Um, and I'm very happy to take this opportunity uh, to talk about something that I, I truly love, um, uh, cognitive neuropsychology. Um, it, is, um, it is something that I did not love immediately. It was something that I had to learn to love. And I learned to love it as I as I slowly discovered, with the help of many uh, good friends, uh, um, how beautiful uh, this approach can be. And I will try and, in this presentation, just uh, near the end, just give a hint of some beautiful results, simple results that have, uh, to my mind, profound implications for the ways in which uh, the, uh, in the example I will use in the case of language, uh, might be organized. So, um, um, there's an uncontested fact, I think um, everyone agrees on, uh, and that is that uh, um, neuropsychological findings have made many fundamental contributions to our understanding of the functional organization of the brain. Uh, in fact, uh, one could say that almost every single thing we know about the human brain uh, has come from neuropsychological investigations. Um, to be sure, there's you know, exciting developments in the, now in the era of neuroimaging, uh, but um, uh, the contributions from neuropsychology is of a different kind, different sort, as I will try and illustrate uh, uh, going forward. Um, this claim about the important role of neuropsychology uh, is, uh, is obvious to anyone who has taken a look at what we know about, about the mind and the brain. And starting with the early studies uh, of people like the Girin, Lissar, Lippmann, and so on, um, beautiful information was generated, provided about uh, visual processing systems, the action systems, language. Um, and this approach, this, these contributions in neuropsychology have continued in more recent years uh, with uh, um, important contributions in areas like memory, uh, the respective contributions of the two hemispheres and uh, the idea of how uh, consciousness might be represented in uh, in two halves of the brain, uh, short-term memory um, um, findings, uh, uh, the finding about motion blindness, um, and uh, uh, also particularly interesting form of visual agnosia that is sort of had a very important impact you know, on our field uh, on uh, uh, a variant of uh, visual agnosia that uh, um, shows a dissociation between um, how we perceive the world and how we can act on the world. Now, I'm sure it hasn't 
uh, escaped your attention. Uh, that every um, example I've cited is an example of a study of a single patient. In each case, some papers, for example, in the paper by Wernicke, they reported actually two patients, um, uh, but the studies were done as uh, single case studies. Um, I am going to be uh, making um, the, the point uh, in this presentation uh, that the, it is not an accident that uh, the cases that became important, the results that became important uh, had their origin in a study of a single individual. A second point I wanna make right away uh, to dispel some misunderstandings uh, that are thrown around is that uh, neuropsychological research by its very nature uh, inseparably links brain and mind. Uh, descriptions of neurological disorders necessarily involve the behavioral characteristics of the disorder and a particular type of brain pathology. Perceptual deficit, damage, for example, to the occipital area. Uh, uh, these, kinds of, uh, uh, these kinds of associations uh, are um, fundamental to the enterprise. And uh, so anyone who wants to study uh, neuropsychological cases, anyone who wants to study the, in, our, in my case, uh, the behavior of patients, uh, will necessarily uh, be doing so in the context of uh, uh, a background of potential claims about the underlying neurological machinery. Um, the second point I, I think I want to make before we sort of really get going is uh, uh, that the depth of analysis of one or the other component of this duality may vary as a function of intellectual interest and of opportunity. Uh, some people are more preoccupied with questions about, if you will, the soup, the, the underlying stuff that makes the mind the object of interest, uh, but other people may be more interested in trying to give a characterization of what the mind is. And uh, uh, ultimately, uh, if one were interested in understanding how the brain works, uh, one would have to, uh, at the description, at the level of your implementation, one would have to uh, discuss the brain. Uh, but I will show you <clears throat> and argue in a moment that one did not do that. Uh, and, um, and, and the reason is one of opportunity. Uh, what I mean by opportunity is that um, we have to have access to relevant information um, uh, and its value to be able to do uh, any work with these patients. So um, what instruments are available to us to characterize one or the other side of the same coin? What can we learn about the nature of perceptual, motor, or cognitive systems and of the neural underpinnings of these systems? Because the studies that we do, studies with brain damaged subjects, where the lesion is placed there, the brain lesion is placed there by nature, we have no control over it. Uh, and so the opportunity that I am referring to is how clean, how clear cut, how precise, how definable is the brain damage in a patient. And if you have a patient with a very large lesion where many, many different mechanisms are involved to try and make claims about uh, the underlying neural representation um, uh, can only be metaphorical, can only be at the level of, uh, it is in the brain somewhere roughly in the left hemisphere, primarily in the left hemisphere, perhaps in the more frontal area and so on and so on. Uh, but, but that's a question of opportunity. Opportunity in terms of what we can say about the brain, uh, given uh, the fact that the lesions are placed there in a way that is not under a control. So in this presentation, I will address a number of uh, issues about the practice of cognitive neuropsychology. And, uh, um, uh, the, um, and so let's start. Uh, let's start with uh, um, with uh, the main point I'll be making, and that is that within the broad domain, um, uh, there's one approach that has come to be known as cognitive neuropsychology. 
So what is cognitive neuropsychology? Um, what assumptions must we make to draw valid inferences about normal cognition from damaged cognitive systems? I will present a pragmatic perspective uh, on this. And uh, uh, I will then make some brief remarks uh, on criticisms to this approach and briefly present some uh, telling results. Uh, I will then discuss objective limitations to the cognitive neuropsychology enterprise and a realistic assessment going forward. So this is my agenda uh, today. So what is cognitive neuropsychology? Uh, put simply, it is the study of the performance of brain damaged individuals to infer the nature and structure of normal perceptual motor cognitive and linguistic processes. It is cognitive science as practiced through the study of discoverable brain induced changes in behavior. It is the functional side of the mind brain. Cognitive neuropsychology straddles cognitive science and neuroscience with its feet more firmly planted in the cognitive science area. We can think of it as a special kind of cognitive science with its merits and problems that we will discuss uh, shortly. And this approach becomes cognitive science in the measure to which meaningful links can be made between the brain to the brain uh, structures. I, uh, uh, I want to stress this again, that the, whether one uh, moves towards neuroscience depends largely with this type of, 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 uh, of, uh, um, uh, of studies, depends largely on opportunity. Now, for my part, I think, I think um, uh, that it is a powerful tool for excavating the secrets of the mind-brain. Um, it is... Uh, an indispensable method, I will argue, for understanding the functioning of the human brain. On this view, the view I'll present here, cognitive neuropsychology helps reveal the representational content at various levels of processing that are not directly observable. In most of the studies that we do, we have an input, we have an output. All we can observe is the external, the final behavior, and we don't have a direct way of looking at the levels in between. Cognitive neuropsychology, by its very nature, allows us to take a peek at these intermediate levels of processing. The identification, or at least their postulation, provides crucial information about the contribution of specific brain structures, although all the precautions about the attributing functions to damaged areas must be followed. In any case, the functional architecture of a cognitive system and the hypothesized locus of functional deficit can be associated with special neural structure, structures processes. That said, I'm gonna repeat myself here. We are back at the issue of opportunity. How good is the neuroanatomical neuro data and how clear is the potential link between function and brain area? So uh, cognitive psychology then is, if you will, a type of cognitive science, a practice of cognitive science, uh, but, uh, but it is not inimical to cognitive neuroscience. And those people who choose to emphasize the functional aspect uh, are not doing so because the brain is not important. It's not because they're dualists, uh, but because the opportunities uh, are not, uh, are not uh, particularly um, uh, good. Now, it should not go, uh, she left unsaid that not everyone shares this view. Everyone has heard about statements like trying to learn about the structure of normal cognition by studying the performance of a brain damaged subject is like trying to learn how a car works after taking after it with a sledgehammer. Uh, this has been variously attributed to Father Bever and Garrett. Certainly it was cited there uh, to Postman and others. Um, for the Reverend Garrett, uh, to argue remarkably little has been learned about the psychology of language processes in normal uh, from a hundred years uh, in normal subjects uh, from a hundred years of aphasia study. I hope 
uh, to convince you that what we can that we can make significant progress in understanding significant aspects of the nation structure of cognitive processes. But at the same time, I have to confess that I don't disagree strongly with Beva, Forber, and Garrett. I think that indeed it is the case that um, the, a particular approach in neuropsychology has not been able to make significant inroads into the structure of cognitive mechanisms. That approach, the approach that is needed uh, for that step, I argue, is the reliance on a particular methodology as we will see in a moment. So uh, a thumbnail sketch of the origin of cognitive neuropsychology. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I, everyone, uh, there are many, many good uh, accounts of this in, in Tim Shalas's book. Um, uh, is a uh, um, book in, in, in the 80s. Uh, um, uh, he gives an excellent account of the origins of cognitive psychology. I think that everyone uh, uh, agrees uh, uh, that uh, um, um, the uh, neuropsychology has become uh, not just uh, uh, the activity of a few individuals uh, um, uh, without any connection to each other, but it has given rise to a journal um, and uh, it has organized a, 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 an annual uh, uh, workshop uh, since 1983 held in Bressanone, uh, Brixen in Italy. Um, and so neuropsychology, cognitive psychology is uh, a recognizable uh, branch of the mind-brain sciences. Uh, uh, the reemergence of, of the approach of cognitive neuropsychology owes much uh, of course, to the developments uh, in, in, the, in the 40s and 50s and 60s in, 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 in the last century, um, uh, with the contributions and uh, 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 the developments of information processing approach to cognitive uh, uh, psychology, um, uh, but also um, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the work of, uh, uh, of neuroscientists, theoretical approaches from uh, the theories of uh, uh, of information processing in the brain uh, to experimental work by Hubel and Weasel, for example, uh, Charles Gross and others, uh, which uh, adopted uh, a, a perspective of the function of the brain um, where intermediate stages, intermediate levels of processing uh, could be identified. Now, an important role uh, uh, in the uh, emergence of cognitive psychology was played by uh, a uh, 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 a, uh, uh, a book um, uh, in uh, um, that everyone I'm sure has heard of called Deep Dyslexia, uh, which, which sort of grew out uh, uh, largely from uh, earlier work um, in uh, neuropsychology uh, from the uh, London group, uh, Warrington, Chalice, uh, Badley and Weiskens. I, I assign Weiskens and Badley to the London group. Cowie, although they were not living in London, but they studied and worked with, with Warrington. Um, uh, and uh, um, um, and uh, neuropsychology um, as an as a identifiable approach sort of really owes much to uh, the book uh, on the dyslexia uh, and, uh, um, uh, and the writings of, uh, of uh, Max Coltar, uh, Carolyn Patterson, uh, John Marshall, and others. Uh, incidentally, uh, one may, uh, uh, may notice that although Patterson was one of the early proponents of this approach, she has uh, sort of grown dismembered of, uh, of cognitive neuropsychology and has written some critical um, um, papers on, on cognitive psychology. I hope that we will be able to take up her criticism if, in the discussion period. So um, uh, a core property uh, of cognitive psychology is that it aims uh, um, uh, uh, to uh, infer uh, the nature of normal cognition from a damaged system. And this aspect of cognitive psychology makes this research paradigm perhaps unique among scientific enterprises, as I will try to illustrate. Uh, this will become clearer as we consider the assumptions that we must make in order to draw inferences from impaired performance to the nature of cognitive processes in the normal brain. 
So what assumptions must we make uh, to draw valid inferences uh, about normal cognition from impaired performance? Um, I'm going to briefly uh, try to uh, make clear what these assumptions are. And I apologize in advance for the formal seeming uh, account of the assumptions that define this approach. Uh, but to help make explicit the properties of the problem we must address when doing cognitive neuropsychology. So uh, in a typical experiment in cognitive science, we draw inferences about the nature of a theoretical model from uh, experiments um, Uh, from uh, um, I draw inference about the nature of, of a theoretical model, M, I will refer to this M, uh, from experimental results uh, or observations. These are the data that we collect. Uh, and we do this uh, in the context of an experimental manipulation that I will refer to as C. So those are the experimental conditions that, uh, that we need uh, to have to be able to link the behavior uh, to the theory. Um, so, Experimental conditions include things like uh, the properties of the stimuli, the exposure duration, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and the like. And we can represent then this relationship as that we can draw inference about M, a theory, uh, from behavior mediated by the experimental conditions that we have manipulated or introduced. Um, the same experimental conditions. <clears throat> the same experiment can be carried out with a brain damaged individual. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if we carry out the same experiment with a brain damaged individual, uh, experimental conditions are the same. See, the same experiment that we did with controls. Um, um, uh, but the performance on that task may be impaired leading to results that are different from those in neurotypical individuals. So this observation, these sort of observations will be different from the ones you would see in the same experiment, perhaps with uh, normal controls. <clears throat> and observed behavior, this behavior can be related to the functioning of a damaged cognitive system, M star. So we can capture this this uh, this um, uh, this relationship with in this in this in this formalism. Uh, note that this behavior doesn't directly tell you anything about the normal system. To be able to uh, uh, to relate impaired performance to a normal system, uh, we have to make uh, we have to make an assumption, um, uh, and. Uh, the assumption is that there must be some discoverable relation between the neurotypical and the damaged system. This system and this system must be relatable in some way. We must be able to recover uh, what that uh, relationship is. And I've referred uh, to this, uh, um, uh, to this uh, uh, link as uh, uh, SL uh, as a lesion. Uh, the assumption is that uh, that uh, uh, that we can infer then how a normal system works uh, by uh, mediating uh, the observations we have uh, in a patient through an assumption about uh, about a functional lesion. Now, <clears throat> uh, a functional a lesions can be either functional, or we can describe it in in, in functional terms, uh, uh, and. Uh, um, <clears throat> or we can des describe it in, uh, in neural terms. We can say there's, a, there's damage in the frontal lobe, say. Okay? In, in, in both cases, we are making an assumption about a change that has taken place. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> this formulation uh, of cognitive psychology investigation makes clear an important duality uh, in this process. In each experiment, or observation performed with a neurological case, there are two sets of experimental conditions. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, those introduced by the researcher, uh, the C's that we had in the normal experiment, uh, say uh, a line drawing versus a real 3D object, and those introduced by nature, 
the ELs, the functional lesions or neural lesions, which affect performance in the same manner as would an experimental condition introduced by the researcher. In this sense, the cognitive system of neurological case can be thought of as an experiment of nature, which has introduced its own set of conditions, a functional lesion I will refer to as LF. Crucially, nature's experimental conditions are unknown and must be inferred from the subject's behavior. For example, a patient has difficulty recognizing a visually presented object, say a cup, but can recognize the same object through haptic input, palpating the object, and can draw a cup when given its name. The patient can also report what cups may be made of and their function. Other tests rule out a low level perceptual deficit, for example. Um, they can copy an image for a, of a cup uh, using the correct colored crayons. Uh, this combination of results allows us to locate the difficulty at a level of processing beyond early stages of visual analysis and before conceptual representations uh, of the object. Obviously, this process requires the formulation of a specific hypothesis about perceptual and cognitive operations. That is, we can only do this work if we have an explicit claim about what M is. You cannot go around postulating possible levels of deficit in the abstract. They are postulated in a specific theory of the cognitive system. <clears throat> Excuse me. So to summarize, um, uh, uh, we can represent the relation between impaired performance and a normal cognitive system as uh, uh, a impaired performance as mediated by two sets of, uh, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of conditions, uh, one that is under our control and one that is not under our control, but is introduced by nature. And this condition must be discovered in order to be able to relate this performance we observe to the cognitive system. Now, a function is can only be inferred, inferred through appropriately detailed behavioral testing. It requires making explicit assumptions about the type of representations, computational modifications at a level or levels of processing in a model of a cognitive domain, as I've already said. I begin with the example of, say, visual object recognition. This step requires the validity of what I have referred to as the transparency assumption. What do I mean by transparency assumption? You must assume that effects of brain damage on the cognitive system are such that at least some of the time, the result only in relatively local modifications of the system, leaving undamaged other parts. And the type of modification that results from damage does not lead to the creation of newly processing structure, of new processing structures. In other words, the functioning of the modified system must represent no more than the local modification of the processes available to the normal system. These assumptions do not imply that the relation between impaired performance and the normal cognitive system is simple or direct, but it does require that it be transparent under analysis, what I refer to as the transparency assumption. Uh, this is a slightly different way of thinking about uh, our uh, uh, the assumption to make them what some people call subtraction assumption of behavior to discuss this later. A potential limitation of cognitive neuropsychology is if the behavior we observe is the result of the functioning of a de novo system. That is, the brain is a highly plastic object that develops new ways of computing that are not merely a reconfiguration of the old pre-morbid system. There's no logical refutation of this potential criticism of cognitive neuropsychology. The only defense we have is of a pragmatic character. The paradigm receives its support from the practical successes it may have in constraining theories of normal cognition. In other words, through converging evidence for the conclusions reached through cognitive neuroscience neuropsychology research. If the brain is indeed as plastic as some would have it, and the behavior we're looking at in brain damaged subjects is the product of these new processes, new kinds of computations, then cognitive psychology cannot inform the function structure of the 
normal cognitive system. It may be useful and interesting to study plasticity, but it would not have uh, the potential to reveal the structure of the normal cognitive system. So we have to make this assumption if you want to continue to study brain damage subjects to infer normal cognition. I lost my cursor. Well, let's see if this works. Sorry, I might. Uh, Uh, my, oh, here it is. Um, as I've already pointed out, the function uh, L can be both atomical and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, an anatomical. Uh, the anatomical lesion can be determined through one of the increasingly sophisticated neuroimaging methods. Um, and uh, the uh, functional lesions uh, uh, through uh, highly detailed um, um, and the functional lesion must be this can only be discovered through uh, as I pointed out highly detailed analysis of the patient's performance. Now, cognitive psychology is probably unlike any other science. Uh, a scientific paradigm. It is not like a classical prototypical experimental science, for example, physics or chemistry, and it is not like primarily observational sciences like archaeology, paleontology, cosmology. Instead, it has some properties like each of the two types of disciplines. It is a mixture of experimental and observational characteristics that are unique to it. Uh, the combination of these characteristics is profound implications for its successful practice. So let's begin by considering first uh, observational sciences. Everyone uh, knows about uh, archaeology, the study of human history and prehistory through the excavation of sites and the analysis of artifacts and other physical remains. Uh, here I've given examples of two such uh, findings. Um, um, in the top slide, I have uh, um, uh, uh, caves containing about 6,000 figures, which can be grouped into three main categories of animals, humans, figures, and abstract signs. Um, uh, those paintings date to about 15 to 17,000 BCE, quite old. Um, these uh, findings, these uh, objects were given to archeologists uh, by nature history. Paleontology. Another example uh, is, uh, you've I'm sure heard of these uh, uh, footprints that were found, uh, the oldest, foot human, uh, oldest human footprints in the Americas of about 23,000 years ago, uh, allowing uh, um, archeologists to uh, uh, make proposals about how um, uh, human um, uh, activities may have developed in those parts of the world and so on. Paleontology uh, perhaps is a little bit uh, uh, more, um, I apologize, but my cursor keeps on up. There we go. Uh, paleontology, uh, I'm sure you've, uh, some of you may have seen uh, in the last um, uh, month or so, uh, this uh, finding, uh, the scientific study of life is, paleontology is a, is a scientific study of life uh, of the geologic past. It involves the analysis of plant and animal fossils it is concerned with all aspects of the biology of ancient life forms, their shape and structure, evolutionary patterns, taxonomic relationships, and so on and so on. Um, recently in the news, you may have seen, uh, uh, there was this amazing finding uh, in, of an articulated in ovo embryo, uh, which is a, are extremely rare. Uh, the excitement was uh, uh, that uh, this, um, uh, uh, the fossil of, uh, uh, of the embryo uh, found it uh, in a position uh, that is not uh, typical uh, of uh, uh, the particular species uh, uh, of which uh, the egg is, uh, but it seems to be more similar to what one finds in birds. And so 
um, so uh, a whole uh, new theory is being developed about uh, uh, about relationship between uh, um, between uh, birds and or avian uh, species and non-avian species. Now, why am I giving you these examples? Um, just to make a simple point. Uh, the point is that um, these uh, uh, um, uh, these disciplines um, um, were given. Uh, these kinds of objects. They did not make them up themselves. Uh, they did not do any experiments. Uh, they simply um, uh, were given these, uh, um, uh, these uh, uh, objects. So a key feature of these disciplines is that the scientific facts are the result of analysis of findings. The researchers are given physical remains and fossils. All they can do is measure characteristics of those objects. These measurements can be exquisitely fine-brained and theoretically beautiful, but they can only be carried out over the objects provided by nature history. Another key feature is that the findings can be unique, as for example, the case of the long, I can't even pronounce this word, the long gut to bifid egg fossil that I just saw. There's only one such specimen that has been found. We may not find another uh, similar fossil for years. Yet, uh, these disciplines proceed in the enterprise with these single observations that are given to them. Physics, uh, on the other hand, uh, has long been considered as a prototypical experimental science. Uh, the experiment is fully in control of the conditions that uh, lead to observations. Uh, and uh, everyone I'm sure is familiar with the famous legend of Galileo Galilei, um, um, uh, who um, uh, was reputed to have dropped uh, uh, a, a ball uh, or different types of balls uh, from uh, uh, different masses from the mast of a galleon or uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa uh, to test whether mass effects uh, affects acceleration due to gravity. Um, now the experiment uh, can be replicated many times, as many times as one wants. We can write a full set of instructions on how to perform the experiment in the minutest detail and measure uh, the outcome. Uh, uh, a better example is, uh, uh, of this is uh, the actual uh, experiments that uh, is known that Galileo Galilei did was on an inclined plane uh, where you could actually measure uh, intermediate uh, levels of, uh, of velocity um, by having uh, uh, situated various type of instruments, uh, measuring time measuring instruments along the course of this uh, inclined plane uh, and was able to make some generalizations about uh, uh, about uh, uh, um, uh, the effects of gravity uh, on mass. Okay. Now, um, uh, the, the point I want to make here is that cognitive psychology differs from both prototypical experimental and prototypical observational sciences. Cognitive psychology is like paleontology. Uh, its objects of study are not created by the experimenter. The objects are findings. In, in the case of paleontology, a fossil, the corresponding object of study in neuropsychology is the patient. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, like physics, cognitive psychology includes experimental manipulations <coughs> with neurological cases, allowing it to generate a range of observations uh, to test specific hypotheses, limited only by the imagination of the researcher and what can be done uh, with human participants. Like particle physics, um, for example, uh, high energy physics, uh, 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 it attempts to reveal internal structure of particles uh, through investigation of exploded components in a particle accelerator. It is also like physics in that it can perform experiments to measure effects of particular manipulations as an example of gravity uh, we discussed before. Uh, but <clears throat> But it is unlike uh, the two prototypical scientific paradigms. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, a methodological consequence of the assumption that we are required to make to draw inf valid inference about normal cognition from damaged cognitive system is that only the single patient methodology is appropriate for this purpose. And that is the claim I'm going to make. <clears throat> it is important to note that although one 
uh, would have thought that there's no need for this emphasis, um, uh, that what is compelled uh, is the methodology uh, and not the number of cases one chooses to report. Assuming access to a large number, num num number larger than one. Uh, the methodology, the, the single patient methodology is a methodological imperative. It is not an imperative how many subjects one should study. If you can study two subjects, that's wonderful. If you can study three, even better. If you study four, better still. However, in each case, the methodology that is required is a single patient methodology. <clears throat> Excuse me. So given uh, this formulation and that the functional lesions is unknown and must be inferred from the subject's performance, we are required to treat each subject as a separate distinct experiment of nature. These properties of experiments of nature disallow patient group studies if the purpose is to inform theories of normal cognitive mechanisms. Uh, let me discuss this, uh, these uh, conclusions very briefly. Um, so uh, here is, is the assumptions we have to make uh, in the group study with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, normal typical individuals. Uh, we make an assumption that we have subjects S1 to SN. Uh, for each of the subjects, we assume that they have a human mind uh, and not a different kind of mind, and therefore it's M. Uh, and we uh, put them in experimental conditions that are identical. We make observations to individuals, and then we have the practice of averaging these uh, um, outcomes uh, because uh, uh, on the assumption uh, that M's are equivalent, uh, C's are equivalent, and so we can uh, uh, treat these uh, as being the product of equivalent uh, conditions. <clears throat> in the case of neuropsychology, we have patients P1 through PN. <clears throat> uh, we assume that M's uh, uh, are normal, they have a human mind in each case. Uh, the experimental conditions uh, are the same. Uh, we uh, have subjected them to the same kinds of experiments, uh, but the functional lesions, L1, cannot be assumed to be the same. Uh, they must be inferred uh, from the behavior of the subject. Uh, and this requirement that we use the data to infer the functional lesion uh, requires that we establish that L's are equivalent. And only once L's are equivalent, we can average the performance. <clears throat> now, that cannot be the case, right? Because, uh, uh, because, the, the, because, because what we're doing is we're using the behavior that we're observing both to infer uh, a functional lesion and to test a theory uh, of, uh, of the mind. And so uh, the problem uh, with trying to uh, use uh, a mechanism or procedure uh, to infer functional lesions uh, to identify a subset of patients who all have the same functional lesion uh, runs, in, runs into difficulties. <clears throat> Is there a problem way around this problem? Uh, one way in which people have proposed is uh, uh, syndrome-based research um, as a way to specify the functional lesion uh, in, uh, uh, in a patient. Um, and uh, um, this approach delegates responsibility for establishing relevant equivalence to a specific set of performance features, some subset of performance O1 through N, uh, that signal a type of cognitive disorder, for example, deep dyslexia, I mean, spatial neglect, uh, broccoli fascia, what have you. But this doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, this doesn't work. What we require to assume to be able to group patients in, is that variation in the behavior of a, on a new task, X, the one for which we are justifying grouping, does not have theoretical consequences. That is the assumption we have to make. Consider patients P1 and P2 who are equivalent on the syndrome feature set, uh, the syndrome criteria. If we want to test theoretical claims based on the performance of, on the new task, such that performance variation on this task can distinguish different hypotheses, then differences on X can have theoretical consequences. Therefore, we must treat performance on X individually, since otherwise we would be removing just the evidence that, in, that is inconsistent with the theory that motivates the syndrome classification. I hope this is clear. What we're saying is that, that if there's a possibility that the behavior of those two individuals on the new task is different in some way, okay, we cannot assume that the subjects have the same functional lesion. 
the functional lesion is determined by the full set of observations we can make on an individual. And it cannot be restricted to only a subset, the subject of, of convenience to the researcher who wants to have a syndrome. <clears throat> so the only case where grouping is justified is where differences in performance on the new task do not have theoretical consequences. If performance on X does not have a theoretical implications, uh, then, then we can average. Uh, but that is a uh, hot uh, useful exercise. But what we're saying is that those observations are not of particular use to us. Otherwise, grouping of task X would be doing so for different, for different functional lesions. Uh, uh, I will consider an example shortly. <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. Additionally, syndrome-based research does not help with the problem of theoretically significant variation within syndrome types. I've written extensively on this. Uh, syndrome types are loosely defined. There are uh, 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 an object of, of fascination for, for many people. Uh, and um, I, I, uh, um, I, I just show here a, a, a number of papers that I wrote a few years ago, uh, and especially a spirited debate discussion uh, with my friend, uh, 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 Edgar Zurif and his friends, uh, and our friends. So here are some papers. I wrote a paper on the logic, on neuropsychological research, the problem of patient classification, uh, and then follow this up with a, a much more detailed analysis of one type of disorder, uh, um, uh, grammatism, where the principal object of criticism was a paper that Rita Burnt and I had written. Um, so I'm an equal opportunity uh, critic of, uh, of these approaches. Um, and Bruce uh, Zurif and, and my former student Brownell and my friend Howard Gardner wrote a paper criticizing uh, this, uh, uh, this paper. Uh, Bellick and I responded uh, uh, to the criticism. Um, uh, Zurif then uh, sought the help of uh, 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 David Swinney and uh, Jerry Fodor, and they wrote a, 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 a response. And then we followed with a paper that has, I think, the best title on, on, uh, in the history of neuropsychology and perhaps in the history of any discipline. Uh, clinical syndromes are not God's gift to cognitive neuropsychology. A reply to a rebuttal to an answer to a response to the case against syndrome-based research. Since this had been going on with many backs and forths, we thought we would say all that. So now, uh, very briefly, uh, uh, some criticisms uh, to the approach that I say we have to turn, that we have to uh, use. Uh, as I've already noted, uh, there really isn't much to say in response to the criticism of, of inadequacy of syndrome-based research. I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that such research has not led to significant insights about the nature of normal cognitive mechanisms and the underlying neural structures. Um, I acknowledge here that the similarity of this bold statement to what Father Reverend Garrett said already 50 years ago. Uh, the squabbles about the precise nature of a syndrome, such as Broca's aphasia, for example, uh, uh, something to which I contributed when I was first introduced to aphasia research, have not abated, and research in this tradition fails to make explicit the cognitive linguistic mechanisms affected in the various syndromes. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Another criticism <coughs> is directed at the view that only single patient subject methodology is appropriate uh, for drawing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for drawing uh, uh, inference about normal cognitive mechanisms and the underlying neural structures from the study of brain da damaged subjects. This criticism has taken several forms. Uh, I will discuss each in turn, okay? Uh, one is that the argument is, is, uh, is that in my formal analysis against averaging across patients classified as presenting with the same syndrome, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, the argument is insufficient to undermine the patient group studies. My, uh, my, my good friend, uh, Tim Shallis, and, uh, and sometimes sparring partner, uh, form, framed this argument as follows. The argument, and quote, the argument presented by Karamatsa seems simple and powerful, uh, yet it proves uh, both too much and too little. It proves too much because it can be extended to normal populations. 
Uh, one cannot even reliably uh, refute theories of normal functioning uh, function using group data from normal subjects. So in other words, if what I argue is correct, then uh, we would not be able to use uh, group data from normal subjects uh, to reject um, uh, theories uh, uh, in normal psychology. Uh, but this misses the crucial element in my argument, namely that we know that the patient is different from the normal population in ways that must be inferred from their behavior. And we can only average the performance of a group of patients once we have established that they have the same underlying cognitive perturbation. Already centuries ago, Laplace and Lagrange in the discussions of the development of the mean made it very clear that the mean is only as good as our ability to be sure that the objects of measurement are elements of the same kind. If we cannot have elements of the same kind, then the mathematical proofs about the value of the mean are useless. So, so I think that the that, that, that the, the point that is missed often in this discussion is that we begin with the observation that the patient is different. And we must infer what that difference is. And we have to qualify it in some way so that we can then relate the performance that we observe an individual to the normal cognitive system. As to proving too little, Schellers' claim is that my argument, quote, does not show that they do not in fact occur for all types of neuropsychological group data. That is true. Um, however, this is a weak argument. What it says is that it is possible that by some miracle, averaging might not lead to a fallacious outcome in some possible world. I admit to this, but it doesn't save patient group averaging. The other uh, objection that has been made is that single patient studies do not allow replication. This is sort of correct. A better formulation would have been that it makes replication hard, even highly difficult to achieve. But this is a small price to pay for a defensible investigation free of the flaw of the violation of violating the principle of type of homogeneity. Um, and uh, think of the paleontologist who obtained the L a long gut to lithid egg fossil. Would we criticize their study of the fossil because it is hard to even, or even near impossible to replicate their study? If replication failure is a price to pay, then it is a price that, price that we have to pay. But it's not the only way one can evaluate the results. Um, uh, there are other ways of assessing the validity of a result. Uh, and um, uh, this is by what I've referred to as a convergence with other results and explanatory value. After all, the objective of this is to develop a coherent theoretical account of cognitive system. So, um, uh, so uh, we uh, our confidence in some, the value of some results, the value of some results depends in large measure on whether or not that result leads to new insights about the system of interest. And we find that it allows and helps us explain the things that were not explained otherwise. It doesn't say that the result, it doesn't say that, that, um, um, that something funny might happen in, in, in that case. We, we, we don't know that. But what we can say is that that result has the characteristics um, that we would like to have for us giving it uh, uh, value. Uh, I should say that Shellis has also found this argument less than convincing, uh, but it would take too long uh, to rebut here. <clears throat> um, um, a, another criticism is that single patient studies are prone to the Martian in a midst problem. That is, uh, the per person, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 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 there's no obvious response to this criticism. It's entirely possible that an individual patient may have had some pre-morbid condition uh, that led the, uh, the development of an atypical cognitive system. If such an individual suffered brain damage, the validity of observations based on this case will be misleading. The only escape for us is that the, this atypical profile will, over time, diverge from other observations. We don't have a logical argument against this possibility, all we can say is it is a possible 
it's a possibility, but, uh, but uh, we have to weigh the value of doing the research against the uh, possibility of something being uh, um, uh, misleading in the end because of this Martian in, in this the problem. And finally, uh, um, uh, it has been proposed that uh, a more uh, um, a more appropriate methodology is the so-called case series approach. This approach has recently gained much attention. Uh, uh, Schwartz and Dell defined the method in this way. Case series methodology involves a systematic assessment of a sample of related patients with the goal of understanding how and why they differ from one from another. This is an interesting methodological development. However, it is unclear what it is meant for in the end. If the tasks that are going to be used with the set of subjects includes, including the series, are restricted a priori, this would violate the spirit of the single patient methodology, since it would not include exploration of the basis for any observed differences among the patients. This approach is not offered as an alternative to the single patient methodology, but its value isn't entirely clear to me. And I think, hope this is clear. If by, by this approach, you mean that you're going to restrict the analysis to a subset of tasks so that you can compare them, okay, then you're violating the principle of uh, establishing the proper functional relation in an individual. And therefore, uh, the, the, the results that you're looking at um, when you compare them uh, are being done under conditions that are not appropriate for uh, the patient in question. This will become clear in an example I will use in a moment. So let's go. To Alfonso, I'm just going to give you a time check. Okay. Oh. It's, yeah, it, it's okay, but, but if you want to wrap up in the next few minutes, that would be great so we can have uh, time for questions. I, I, I always think that I, I, I'm, I, I'm, a fast, I'm a fast thinker. A I'm time. neither a fast a thinker nor a fast speaker, it seems. Okay, um, so um, yes, I, it's going to be a truncated talk. Um, uh, uh, um, there are objective limitations uh, uh, to the psychology enterprise and a realistic assessment uh, uh, going forward has to be uh, taken. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, I apologize for being so, so, so sloppy. Uh, I, I'm going to, to just give one, one example uh, of, uh, uh, of some of the problems that we encounter in doing um, uh, in, do, in doing uh, cognitive neuropsychology, and then and then move uh, to uh, to the conclusion. So, take uh, as an example uh, the case of the occurrence of semantic paraphrases in naming. Um, these are, are typical kinds of uh, uh, of, uh, of errors uh, shown a picture of a hammer. Some patients might name it a saw, a tool, a screwdriver, a nail, a wood box. Um, this tip symptom is typically be taken uh, as evidence of damage to the semantic system. Uh, um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> However, there are multiple loci of deficit that could give rise to this kind of, of such, such errors. For example, uh, is it a type of visual agnosia? You said, um, for example, modality specific deficit involving only the processing of visual stimuli. Uh, uh, tests in other modalities would help re resolve this question. Other tasks could hone in on how general the deficit is. Can the patient read the word hammer? or write it to dictation and so on. In some cases, the impairment is to the semantic system as demonstrated by the fact the patient has difficulty, not just in naming pictures, but also in word comprehension tasks, reading and writing the names of objects. A case in point is patient KE, study by, by um, together with, uh, with Brenda and Archie Hillis and Christina Romani, uh, who made uh, almost uh, exclusively semantic errors in all tasks involving um, uh, word comprehension and production. <clears throat> uh, however, other patients make semantic errors uh, only in some tasks, not others. Uh, for example, patient RGB as shown here and SJD uh, made semantic errors only in speaking or only in writing. Okay, so patient RGB made semantic errors only in uh, uh, in, uh, in speaking and the other patient only in writing. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
And the lexical processing deficit can be even more fine-grained as in the case of patients HW and SJD who made semantic errors only in speaking uh, or writing. So they make semantic errors in speaking or writing, uh, respectively, uh, for the verb form of homonyms like to play and the play. Uh, these cases show that the interpretation of an error depends on the overall pattern of performance in the patient. In other words, a functional lesion in the system must be identified in order to interpret performance in various tasks. So a semantic error is not a semantic error, it's not a semantic error. A semantic error is a kind of error in a particular, the results of a particular level of processing and you job is not to simply call it error, semantic error, but to show that what its, its prominence is, what are the facts that lead to the error having the form that it does. Okay, so, um, um, so this constellation of results uh, severely restricts uh, uh, possible architectures of the organization of the lexical system. Um, I was going to go on and I hope that I will be given a chance to uh, do the ha second half of this talk at some other time. Uh, I was going to go on to, um, uh, to uh, show that, that, um, that by doing these kinds of analyses, uh, uh, we can actually test claims about the organization of the lexical system. And we can identify points in the system where the source of the difficulty is. And this is what I meant at the very beginning of this presentation, why cognitive psychology may be an indispensable method for analysis. In some sense, it is, it is just like the uh, particle accelerator in physics. The physicist does not have any obvious way of looking at the internal structure uh, of a particle. It can do so only by taking it apart. And we can think of of uh, the psychology as by analogy having this same function. We can localize what the internal pieces are in the structure of the system. This unfortunately has not played out as well as one would like it to play out in the field, in part because it's very hard to do these kinds of experiments, uh, and in part perhaps because there's some kind of mistrust of the study of, uh, of, of drawing inferences from impaired performance. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so let me then just go to the to 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 the conclusion um, that uh, um, that uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, let me just go to make two final points. One to discuss some uh, objective uh, limitations of the approach. Um, so one limitation seems to be the reluctance of a large segment of cognitive scientists to accept the evidence from the performance of brain damaged individuals to constrain theories of normal cognitive processing. This reticence is difficult to explain, but it is a strong impediment to the growth of cognitive neuropsychology. One is tempted to think that perhaps the reticence manifests only when the results prove to be recalcitrant for a favored theoretical position. But I think such reticence uh, is based at least in part on a general distrust that anything useful can be learned from studying the damage, a damaged system. A second limitation is due to the very nature of this enterprise. Cognitive psychology is the study of experiments of nature and as such, we cannot engage in research without nature's help, which is fickle. We don't control when the next clear experiment will become available. So like paleontology and archaeology say, we have to wait for the opportunity to study patients with particular deficits. This lack of control is a strong disincentive to dedicate one's effort to something with a large degree of uncertainty. This reliance on opportunities for research that are not under the control of the experimenter is especially problematic in a societal organization that often rewards high rather than, high rather than quality productivity leading to choices and decisions that favor publication, even when there is really nothing worth reporting. But also an unwillingness to risk one's career for a beautiful scientific enterprise, but fraught with uncertainties about their collaboration and the risk of feeling marginalized from the larger enterprise devoted to studying the mind. Obviously, these difficulties are especially problematic for the new generation of researchers who must show productivity early in their career. So we have to adjust our expectations uh, about what can be achieved in this field of study. It requires a willingness to take opportunities as they arise, not just in neuropsychology, but also with other tools to study uh, the mind-brain. As already noted, 
uh, we must adjust our expectations about the level of productivity we can expect to achieve with experiments of nature. One important step would be to emulate the research organizations in fields like archaeology and paleontology. We would have to find a way to create a patient directory that allows the possibility of collaborations with researchers in different subspecialties. Patients who have been studied in some detail and presented with a sufficiently discrete deficit would be entered in a database for further study. This route may make most cases available and allow greater in-depth projects with researchers with different theoretical perspectives, always a good thing. While this may be an exciting development for a field, there, is potentially serious, there are potentially serious ethical uh, issues protecting the patient from exploitation for science. If we were to implement such a project, we would have to also implement an ethics board composed, uh, composed uh, 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 of citizens uh, uh, not directly uh, involved in the research. Despite the many object, objective problems uh, that I've listed, I remain op optimistic about the future of cognitive neuropsychology. It is the scientific enterprise best place to reveal the nature of biologically defensible levels of representation that are difficult to reveal otherwise. On a personal level, I've just recently benefited from identification uh, of uh, two individuals whose performance has excite, exciting implications for a theory of visual object identification. And here's a link to one of them. So if you are interested, may take a look at this link, a, a beautiful case studied by uh, Gilles van der Score and my uh, friend, uh, Al Gallo <clears throat> uh, There are many people who have helped uh, shape uh, my understanding of the nature and value of the cognitive psychology enterprise. A list here, uh, only those who helped me in my early years in the field and some recent collaborators. And uh, you know all of these people, Brenda Rapp, Archie Hillis, Mike McCloskey, Gabriele Michelli, Christina Romani, Brad Mahon, Gilles Van Score, Tim Shallis. Tim Shallis, Tim Shallis, yes. Um, Max Coltart, Sida Hakbik, Jan Chao B. Um, I, I think that everyone knows uh, that uh, the best uh, the best way to learn is to have someone who criticizes you. And that's why Tim has been such a great mentor because he never agrees with hardly anything I say. Uh, and therefore he offers a, a good uh, a sounding uh, ground uh, uh, for uh, exploring and testing ideas. Uh, thank you uh, to Jamie Ward and uh, uh, the British Association of Cognitive Neuroscience for this opportunity. And my sincere apologies for being over long as I always am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alfonso. A lot of food for thought there. Uh, I really like the analogy between kind of discovery science, kind of finding the case study that's like the archaeopteryx or something like this, and uh, the challenges of uh, doing that and how you can uh, collaborate and so on. If you don't mind uh, stopping sharing your screen, there are um, Brenda Rapp or Tim Chalice might like to unmute and ask a question. I'll leave it to one of you, and then you will be visible to the audience when you do that. I'm happy to start with a question. Hi. Alfonso, thank you so much. That was just great. Um, and I, like Amy, am also... Sorry, should I start now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you heard. But anyways, thank you so much for that. And like Jamie, I found the... Um, the, 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 the drawing the connection to paleontology to be really extremely valuable. I mean, I think that um, I, I hadn't thought of that before and I think it really captures um, what is really a, a really critical part of this um, enterprise. And through the analogy, um, most people think paleontology is of course incredibly valuable. So I think the analogy may be helpful um, to others in really sort of processing, you know, what it is that cognitive neuropsychology can offer and what its place, you know, in the, in the larger cognitive science enterprises. So thank you for that. Um, I had a number of points that I wanted to make, but let me, um, let me just try to actually, let me try to, I'll start with one. Um, so, so given that, you, that one recognizes that the transparency assumption is an assumption, right? And it may or may not hold. Um, and so I, that, that makes perfect sense. Every approach, you know, every enterprise has assumptions, but given the transparency assumption so that it could, it's possible 
that the system reconfigures itself and after damage and you know creates a cognitive system that's different from the normal system. So given that possibility, um, and um, and so and and given that the one of the key checks on that is convergence of evidence, right? So you know why are we why do we have confidence that the, that cognitive neuropsychology, you know, does provide understanding of cognitive systems, despite the, 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 the worries about reorganization and, and also the Martian problem, the concern that there, you know, there may be different minds, you know, we, we, we nonetheless think it's useful. Given those two problems, um, do, you, do you think that it would be important or even, do you think it would be important for researchers in cognitive neuro, sorry, and given that the con converging evidence is sort of what allows us to be confident of our results. So we know that the brain could be reorganizing. We know that there could be Martians amongst us, but the fact that we find results from um, cognitive psychology working with normal participants that converge on the cognitive neuropsychological findings, that's what gives us the confidence that these issues are not necessarily, um, don't necessarily rule out the enterprise. So given that, do you think that it would help the practice of cognitive neuropsychology and cognitive neuropsychologists if case studies were necessary, or you know, were you know, the 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 requirement would be that they would be accompanied with um, studies with healthy participants that provided convergence. I mean, obviously, logically, it's not necessary. So this is not that we logically need to do that. But in terms of supporting the enterprise, I'm wondering mm -hmm. whether this would be a, a, a way of strengthening. Um, the approach, um, and just in practice. So I was curious to know what you thought of that. I didn't explain that extremely clearly, but no, hopefully no. <laughs> you made, that made sense. No, I, I understand. I yeah, I think it would be a great idea. I, I think though that it, it places an, an ex <clears throat> extreme burden on on the researchers. And again, going back to the question of trying to get new researchers to come to the field, uh, making that task near impossible impossible in terms of the amount of work that is required. And given that we live in a uh, sort of a capitalist oriented mentality uh, of how science should be done uh, and that what is important is the mass production of these things of modern times uh, uh, kind of model of, uh, of productivity. Uh, I think I think it is it would be very difficult uh, to, to do that. But I think that the spirit is I agree with the spirit of, of, the, of, the, of the proposal, uh, but but the convergence can also be within neuropsychology. That is uh, the ways in which other patients fit in in, in these kinds of things. Um, I didn't go unfortunately into detail about the model I was going to present about. Uh, uh, lexical production, just as an example, uh, but there's lots of converging evidence within your psychology of how those things come together. Uh, you're fully aware, you're an author in the, many of the papers you wrote on the dissociations in those patients were found, and those kind of dissociations sort of were predictive, if you were predictable, if you will, from a particular conception of how the lexical system might be organized. So, uh, so the results look bizarre. Why would a patient make semantic errors um, uh, of, of this sort and only for these things, uh, there's a reason for it, a good reason, okay? And then of course, you, I agree with you, you test this. And some of us have done that. I spent 10 years doing normal psychology experiments, psychoanalytic like experiments, following up on, the, on, the, on those ideas. So yes, but, but I, I don't want to, to, to place the burden on the individual uh, any more than we put the burden on the, people do normal psychology and use this bizarre measure called reaction time. I mean, but what, what does it reveal about anything? If you think about the number of assumptions you have to make to be able to say that the button press relates to a particular level in the system, it is bizarre. That this, no one has actually done that and shown that in fact it is true that it does that. It is an assumption we make and we live with that. So I think that there is this invidious uh, argument is made about, about what is good stuff or simple stuff, direct stuff, and what is problematic. Um, so so uh, um, we all live with the assumptions and we die and we die by them too. That is, the assumptions is what drives the enterprise and once you make them explicit and live with them. Uh, and um, yeah, every discipline has got all kinds of bizarre assumptions um, that, that have to be made. 
Let me give a final example. Unfortunately, I've been reading into uh, this book, an interesting book I, I, I encourage everyone to read called uh, Lost in, in, in Math uh, about uh, particle physics and, uh, and these, sort of these new uh, sort of uh, uh, supersymmetry theories uh, that are proposed. And that the only way in which they can test it is to have levels of energy that are so high that are practically impossible to achieve. Okay, so here are the, our, the, the queen science, physics, and, uh, and they're not able to even generate the kinds of experimental observations that they need to test their theories. And so they've resorted to making judgments about the beauty of the math in, in saying I mean, yeah, to choose between accounts, which is a perfectly fine uh, approach to take. I have no, no objection. But what I'm saying is that the difficulties in trying to link experimental evidence to theoretical claims is not something that affects only cognitive neuropsychology. Uh, it affects all fields. And we have to be bolder in being critical of the criticisms, in showing that, in fact, the criticisms are misguided. Tim, do you want to come in at this point? Well, I, I, I had... Uh, two sorts of feelings about Alfonso's presentation. Half of it, the part about why single case studies are, are useful, I agreed with entirely. And I thought that fit, but I thought that the, another aspect of it, which is all these different methods in neuropsychology, which he monster bars, says we shall not use to make theoretical uh, claims, fits very badly with his final conclusions about all the social pressures making cognitive neuropsychology less attractive to people than it was, say, 30 years ago. But he's, he's, he's now chipping away in, inside cognitive neuropsychology at things he shouldn't do. And, for instance, the objection to group studies. Uh, let's take a, a combination of group studies and syndrome. There's Bradley and Warrington's paper in 1970 showing that uh, amnesic patients have normal recency effects in free recall. Now, that's got syndrome, amnesia. It's got group study because you average the, over the six patients. Uh, I would argue that this, that it, given that you assume that an amnesic patient is a patient with a deficit in episodic memory, what this is showing is that episodic memory does not include the recency effect, which is in another, another memory system. Is, going, is Alphonse going to monster by that? Uh, it would take, for instance, another way of, of amalgamating in terms of lesion location. Brenda Milner in 63 or 64 showed that lesions of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex in a group study lead to very poor, form, poor performance on set shifting tasks with constant card sorting. Is that to be monster barred and rejected? I feel that Alfonso's justification of the single case study doesn't need to associate with it an attack on all sorts of other methods within neuropsychology, which can provide useful information as well. Um, I uh, thank you, Tim. Um, I, I think I, I think I, I think you you have not sort of. Uh, you have not, you have not um, taken the, the, the claim that I'm making. Let me let me try and make it again. Okay, the, I've said repeatedly over the years that if you want to do a group study, you can do a group study. You can do ten group studies. You can do a thousand group studies. The question is, what assumptions do you make about the study that you did? And what can you conclude from it? Let's take well, the example obviously of the Warrington. Warrington. Study let's, take, let's, take Warrington. let's take Warrington first. Okay. So you say there were six subjects and, uh, and they, they got this interesting result and so on. Okay. Um, now, suppose that you took the six subjects and you uh, analyzed the, the, them individually, and perhaps you did several additional experiments with the sub subjects, and you were to find that in fact, the average value that you get when you look at the six subjects uh, includes two subjects uh, who have a profile that is very different from the other four on the question of interest. The question is, uh, what do you do? 
the way you're talking about it, they say, all my only responsibility is to do the averaging and show that there's a significant effect. And I'm saying that that is misguided. I'm saying that that is only possible, it's only meaningful if in fact I can, I can, I can, I can show that the, I don't have disconfirming evidence in my sample. If I only make measurements that are too weak to have a detailed analysis, then the study will have to have an asterisk mark. It will have to remain as a study for which there is no way of establishing whether it is a good study or a bad study. So, so the, the point is always, the point is always what kind of inferences, what kind of assumptions do, do I make and what kind of things I'm trying to understand. Now, uh, so, so I- I laid out the assumptions. Sorry? I laid out the assumptions. The assumptions are first that amnesia is a syndrome characterized by a theoretical position of a loss of episodic memory. Uh, right, but, 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 but uh, so, 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 you, so, so, you're saying amnesia is a special case, um, uh, because I'm not saying it's a special case. I'm giving an example of, of a single. Uh, of a single right, one. right, right, right. Now, is, is it true that amnesia is uh, a homogeneous uh, 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 syndrome? Is it true that amnesia is this? Is this that whatever the thing we call amnesia? Uh, is uh, uh, occurring in the same way in all those individuals. Okay. And, uh, and you haven't shown that, Tim. You haven't shown that. You simply have asserted that because you get a result that you like with six subjects, that therefore it's fine. No, it is not fine. You would have to actually look at those six subjects in enough detail to show that it's not fine. If I had an alternative hypothesis, I have another literature, unfortunately, so I cannot speak intelligently about it. But, but it, in, if, if it was in something I knew something about, uh, what I would want to know is, uh, is, is variation in performance on that task such that it could actually test alternative accounts? If it doesn't, if it doesn't make any difference, as I pointed out earlier, then yeah, average. It doesn't, doesn't disconfirm any theory. Okay. If, uh, however, the, the performance, uh, uh, alternative forms of the performance could lead to different theoretical accounts, then you are not allowed, allowed in the sense, not militarily, but not allowed, I mean, uh, uh, in terms of coherence, uh, to uh, 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 average the data without establishing equivalence of function relation. Well, I, don't, I think you're ignoring the fact that one can actually be, develop theoretical perspective. You, you've, you've got one stage of the perspective. You're assuming that amnesia is scientifically demonstrated to be a, a loss of episodic memory. Given If you make that theoretical assumption, then you can go one step farther and say, given the patients that are manifesting this, then... You, you, you can restrict the what episodic memory covers somewhat by excluding short-term memory. Uh, well, well you take the you take the other example I gave, Brenda Milner. Well, but can we finish this first one? Can, can we finish this just to make a point? Okay, when you test the, the patients with amnesia, you do so in a particular context, a new experiment, a new task. The task includes not just the memory functions of interest to you, but a whole bunch of other things that are going on with the kinds of stimuli you're looking at, okay? The question then becomes, uh, how, how does my theory of memory, when implemented in the particular task I'm doing, relate to the possible effects of those other dimensions on behavior, okay? And that would then determine what, what it is that you're measuring. You, it, it, it is much more complicated than simply saying I have amnesia and then I can just use a task and, and, and average. You also have to look at the way the contribution of the task uh, in the terms of the forms of the task, uh, how this interact with a memory system, whatever memory system is. Okay. But anyways, let's go to the, to the next case. What's the other case? I'm sorry. The, the other example was Brenda Milner's work on Wisconsin card sorting and dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex showing Deficits of set shifting after dorsolateral prefrontal cortex lesions. I'm going to move you on quite 
quickly though, Alfonso, if you want to quickly say anything about that, and then I, I'm sorry. I'm going to move you on quickly though. If you want to give a quick answer, if not, um... uh, uh, oh, I see. Um, I, or, or what I was going to say, what I was going to say is 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 that um, that I don't know about the study. It's embarrassing. Uh, what I was going to say, yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, I'd like to know more about the study to to say that. Uh, to say that you get some difference that, uh, between groups, that's that's fine. I, I, I all I all I can say is that that overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the insights, the new insights about the nature of cognitive systems have not come from the enterprise of group studies. Okay, in every single area of cognitive of neuropsychology, okay? the all the cases have always been individual cases. So let's take the case of the yeah. People don't know the Brenda Miller case. You, you can have. Oh, well, I, yeah, I, I, don't I don't know. It. That's true. I don't know. It, I, it's, it's true. But but um, but it would be good if you could take some examples of modern things that that uh, that have. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I apologize. I, 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 I apologize. I don't know that study. I should I should take a look at it. Alfonso, uh, I'm going to to wrap up here. I'm just going to ask uh, one more question, and that's. Um, if we think of cognitive neuropsychology as kind of being almost observational or being driven by what gives us, is there like a finite number of ways in which we can carve the cognitive system? We've discovered agnosia, we've discovered amnesia. Yes, we might be able to kind of look at variations of that, but is that enough, I suppose, to, to move this forward for the next generation in that they are they're just fine tuning little differences amongst agnosia rather than the big right. discoveries that were made? Right. 30 years ago, for example. Right. What is no, that? No, I, I, I think, I, I hope I didn't, I didn't confuse everybody. Uh, it, it, cognitive psychology is a hybrid. It is a unique approach in scientific practice. It's a hybrid approach. It has both characteristics of the observational science in that it is limited in what the experiments it will be given. And it is like, like physics in that it can design experiments. Uh, in, okay. So in fact, because of that, neuropsychology has tremendous potential because any case you study where the functional lesion is sufficiently uh, uh, transparent to allow us to make inference about a particular level of system, there are a thousand experiments one can do. Okay? So, so we, are not, we are not limited like paleontology where we just can just take some measurements of given the instruments we have. In cognitive psychology, we are like physics in terms of these experiments. So, so it is, it is a, a, a most tremendous experience. All I, I gave people are a reference to a paper that's just come out in cognitive neuropsychology by Van Score uh, with a, about 100 tasks were used in, in the, for that paper to try and identify as precisely as possible the nature of the problem. And there are many other experiments that can be done with this case. So, so and other cases like this one. Uh, so, um, I, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. It is, it, it is something that, that, that uh, uh, I'm excited about doing. I, I don't know if I've convinced anybody that it is, it is. It's the only discipline, the only approach that allows us to look inside in a way that, that, we, can, that we can control. Give me another approach that we can use in neuropsychology where we can do that in, sorry, in, in, in psychology or, or in neuroscience. And neuroscientists can do that. They can go inside and look. Okay, we can't, okay? The only way we can do it is by looking at, the, at, at this, at this at the behavior. Alfonso, thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. A, am I, are, are Brenda and Tim gonna disappear? So what I've done now is that I've ended